वेलकम टू श्रुति आउटलाउड हाई एवरी वन एंड गेस्ट हूज बैक बैक अगेन इट्स मी अगेन विद अनदर एपिसोड ऑफ श्रुति आउटलाउड पॉडकास्ट एंड आई होप यू गाइज हैड अनदर गुड वीक a productive week and you did loads of good things and had fun and i hope that you know uh, even this weekend is planned out all good for you and uh, thank you for joining in so for today's session we have another very 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 special guest and so far this guest is the you know the the first of her kind so far and uh, so this guest is about science and today we are going to talk about science there are going to be questions about science there are going to be answers about science and it is going to be a very 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 sciencey episode our guest lipakshi khurana has joined our session and before uh, basically bringing her on board uh, let me tell you just a little bit about her so lipakshi is a protein biochemist with 6 plus years of re- uh, research experience and today we are going to talk about her journey her career and basically how did she reach here and what is she up to these days and whatever she is doing how is it going to be sort of you know change the world and everything so without wasting another minute let's call upon lipakshi and take this discussion ahead perfect so lipakshi let's start with your day i'm really sorry that you had to wake up really early for this session and you know being a saturday being a weekend so apologies from my side but how do you feel well honestly this is not very early morning for me anymore like many many years ago i i was not a morning person but since i started working in the industry here the industry norms and the timings that people work around here is very different so Uh-huh. I've gotten used to it but I would still say that you know Saturday is God's day and you woke me up on that day. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely yeah. that's why you know I am apologizing that I'm sorry that I did it but here we are I'm so glad that we have you for this discussion for this session and this mm-hmm. absolutely amazing conversation that we are going to have. So Lipakshi let me ask you one question before you know getting into the actual topic what time do you otherwise wake up like what's your schedule like during the weekdays like what do you do when you wake up what time do you wake up and how does it go on so honestly uh, my schedule even on unlike most of the weekdays is to be at work at 8 o'clock and mm-hmm. when i say that i am at work at 8 o'clock i am not the first ones to show up um mm-hmm. a lot of people in my company especially summer time here people prefer to be at work at 6:30 a.m. and they wow. want they want to leave like yeah, they want to do their work and then they want to leave by like 2 or 3 o'clock because oh. then you get the rest of the day and you feel like okay there's still a good chunk of time where you can do something um Absolutely. it helps it helps more once it's winter time because you know uh here around in winter time around 4:35 it's already dark outside and right. a lot of people don't like the idea of going home when it's dark because then you you kind of mentally feel that you know you don't have much time to do anything personal or enjoy your personal time so people right. prefer to go very early in the morning for me wow. 8 o'clock is a good time like if i am at work at 8 i feel like okay i i have already achieved something for the day and, <laughs> absolutely um, but Yeah, yeah like i'm so amazed that you it. it's so people actually are at their desk at 8 6:30 in the morning like yes. 6:30 yes wow there wow. are a lot of people who prefer to be at their desk at 6:30 and they leave by um 2 or 3 o'clock because then you know you have so many hours when you can just have your personal time it also Absolutely. helps like people who have kids they also prefer to go early in the morning cuz they'll drop off their kids and by the time their school is over you're already on your way back home so uh-huh. a lot of people do it for that and then there are also youngsters who like to do it because then especially during summer time they know that once they're done with their work uh-huh. they can just d- directly go to a beach or something and they can enjoy the rest of their day Absolutely. i'm still an 8 o'clock person it's it's still good <laughs> enough for me 
So have you tried switching to maybe 6.30? Like, have you ever tried it or has that thought come across that, okay, maybe, you know, instead of 8, maybe, maybe, just maybe I'll try and reach work around 6.30. Have okay. you given it a shot? I, I have thought about it many, many times. Um, uh -huh. I think in between, like, two months ago, uh, I got to a point that I was at work at 7.30 and that itself was an <laughs> achievement for me. And I was like, okay, I can slowly push it like that, but... Yeah. Once this COVID-19 <laughs> thing happened and I started seeing people not, people going in shifts and working, I kind of got right. back to my eight o'clock time and I was like, you know what, I think, I think this is a good balance for me and I, I don't, I don't Absolutely. think I can be a 6.30 a.m. person, at least not now. I don't have the motivation to do it right now. Yeah, maybe, maybe a few years down the line, you never know, you just might be that person who actually reaches at six o'clock, like 6 a.m. Even that is a possibility. Okay. No, I was saying that, you know, for me, working in the industry has been just six months before this, uh, a good chunk of my research experience was in academics. And uh, mm -hmm. in academia, the timing is not like, there are two polarized kind of people working in the academics, some people uh -huh. who are like 6.30 a.m. people. And then there's this another bunch who was what I was like, who shows up at 10, and then they'll work till seven or eight, especially in your grad school, because there is no starting time and ending time for grad school for grad students for them uh -huh. you basically live in the lab and you're you know that you're going to spend your entire day in the lab anyways so you you get more flexible about timings but in industry because you're working with a team and your project mm -hmm. is just not your project you have to adjust it in a way that you work at the time that other people that you need are also mm -hmm. around and I think that's the only reason I started switching to going at 8 a.m. in the morning. But maybe my, my, this can be my next year's goal to achieve. Like, Are the, like how is the work culture in stake when it comes to the flexibility of timing and choosing your work hours? Like, it what window from, do you... Uh, so I think it, it, a lot of it depends on the work that you're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. But in my field in particular, um, it's not the timings that drive your work everything uh -huh. is very target oriented like right. you do your work in four hours and you're done you can go home you do uh -huh. your work in nine hours you can go home like yeah. you don't have to sit in the office just for the sake of it because uh, -huh. uh there can be a lot of things that you can do when you're home so uh -huh. you have to choose your own timings like for me choosing an eight o'clock time was not something that was told to me by by, by my boss um, mm -hmm. he actually comes in at seven o'clock in the morning and he leaves at three. Um, okay. It's a time that you choose for yourself. There are also people in my team, uh, like I have an undergraduate student in my team. She likes to come and uh, work from nine to five. It's her choice. Mm -hmm. She right. knows that she can come in at nine and she can finish her work at five o'clock and then she can go home. If there is a day that, you know, she finishes her work at three o'clock, she doesn't need to sit around to yeah. finish her hours because the whole idea is project driven and that also means that there can be days that your project needs to you to be there longer than your mm -hmm. traditional eight hours then you have to right. be around especially in the field of science because uh -huh. uh, science doesn't wait for the time or your meals or anything else you you move around these things around your experiments especially when you're doing something on a bench like on a lab work uh, -huh. uh everything you know, in in terms of your lunch hours, your breaks, your tea breaks, your coffee breaks, all that okay. goes around your research. The way if your experiment is running, okay, I know that now there is a time that it's just going to be mm -hmm. incubating on its own. This is a good time for me to go get lunch. So yeah. everything moves around your experiment. and then But then it varies from the work that you're doing. It varies between companies to companies. Um, I know that there are people who do like more service sector kind of work. Uh, mm -hmm. They have their own set hours. But th and then again, the flexibility depends on your manager, how he yeah. believes in it. But overall, in terms of the work culture I've seen is it's mostly project driven in most of the companies and your timings are flexible. They're very flexible about your work hours. Right. So um, tell me something that uh, because as you said that, you know, everything is project driven. So um, was it easy for you to sort of, you know, adjust to that part? Like, 
your meals are not fixed and you know basically nothing of that is sort of fixed so how okay are you with that or were you okay with it just from the very beginning and you were like oh yeah absolutely this 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 is working absolutely for me so could you tell us a bit about that part i think you know when you've been doing this work for so many years i think it's been like 8 years that i've been in the field of research now and this is something you get trained during your grad school like okay. uh, it it's mentally imbibed in you that um your work and your experiment mm-hmm. takes uh precedence over anything else that is going around and i'm yeah. not saying that i have to starve myself to get my experiment done you know Um, uh-huh. when you're in the field of science it is a expectation that everybody that's around you you help each other um mm-hmm. and that is something people genuinely do they offer to help you like you know when i'm doing my experiment for the day my manager will come and he'll constantly keep asking me that have you had your lunch do you need okay. a break because then i can switch over and you can go that way the experiment mm-hmm. can keep on going because Uh-huh. if you pause the experiment for this then you'll have to stay longer which is something even my uh-huh. manager doesn't want for you because he wants you to be happy at work so uh-huh. it's it's a culture in the field of science that you know um wherever you're working whether it be academia or whether it be industry the people around you know that uh you have to keep helping each other otherwise you're going to basically you're going to be starving yourself or you're going to be sleepy and sometimes you can be sick like I I have severe allergies um pollen allergies um okay now that I've been living here so there have been moments that I've been in the middle of an experiment and I have I start getting a severe allergy and you know people offer to come and finish your work for you um you just have to guide them and let them know what you are really expecting from this so it's mm. not that bad it's not like I'm killing myself um just to get a meal it's not that way <laughs> good to know that good to know that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i'm so glad about that part that you know basically yes, this is how everything works and people are there to support you and basically yeah because you know everybody yeah. is working uh same tangent i would say so people understand yes uh, that's an understanding and, that you definitely develop over time in grad school um, yeah that's why they say grad school doesn't just train you for science they train you to build these different qualities of helping each other you constantly keep asking yeah. people do you need any help do you need any help uh it's something that's imbibed in you because you know that today you help them you're going to need that help too so it goes absolutely. back and forth absolutely so i'm i'm so glad about this part that you know there's this professional support system and yes. yeah so it totally works in your favor and obviously the kind of things that you guys do i think that's brilliant thank you all right so let's actually let's uh, get into the depth of this conversation and you know let's take it ahead from there and i am sorry that i grilled you a bit about your work hours and everything so um let's start with your background how did you start this off and basically could you just you know maybe walk us through all of that your journey <laughs> okay um i'm going to be very frank about this i don't think that i was a prodigious child who you know uh, always knew that i'm going to make it in the field of science or uh-huh. um that's not something that i always thought yes okay i grew up in india where um, i think a lot of parents always push you to the idea that if you want if you want to make it big in this world uh-huh. a, a science is a field that you should pick it's something that yeah. was imbibed in me since i was a child okay um, and that's how i chose science to begin with not something that i thought okay this is my field no that that's not how i chose science um and then once i did my high school um mm-hmm. i got admission in bachelor's of pharmacy mm-hmm. and again i i liked the idea of working in the field of science in the sense that i was able to understand the concepts of it um science works purely on logic and as long as you keep following that logic Uh-huh. you can learn a lot of things and i think that's how i finished my bachelor's but um okay. to consider research as my field um i think it was like in the middle of my grad school that i really realized that this is something i want to do even when oh. i applied to come to united states and i think there are a lot of people who apply to united states not 
completely knowing how mm-hmm. research is actually pursued because um currently in the field of science and technology um india is really up ahead in terms of the training that they give you based on theoretical knowledge okay. we are better trained than many many places mm-hmm. but um getting in hands on experience on how research works the idea mm-hmm. of how you build your projects is something that i didn't have an idea of when i joined research um okay. it was only during my second or third year of uh research that i started enjoying the aspect of research like you know for the first time when you do an experiment that leads to some kind of results that makes you realize okay i have understood and figured out something that most of the people in the world do not know until i don't publish this work only i am the person who has that information that feeling if you can enjoy that feeling then you understand that you know research is something that you can pursue that's something right. you can enjoy over time but it comes to you over time that's why they say that grad school is a very big commitment because you're there for 5 mm-hmm. 6 years not completely knowing what you're jumping into till you are in the depth of it and then you realize okay this is something that i like or whether you don't like uh-huh. that's something that comes to you over time it's not something that at least for me i don't think that's something i uh, grew up with it's something that grew on me over time and okay. uh, from there like once i started realizing that i enjoy finding these answers to new questions and how it drives you look you, you start seeing that every time you get that answer that day is a happy day for you that that motivation drives you to be in the field uh lebakshi hold on a second i have lost your uh, like i cannot hear you let me just uh, invite you once again okay All right, we lost Lipakshi's voice for a while. Let's invite her back and take this conversation ahead. Yes, sorry for the glitch, but here That's we are right. back again. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so I was saying it was only during my graduate school that I started realizing that this is something that I enjoy. and okay. would like to pursue further and then i moved from grad school to postdoc um i got this opportunity at yale university um it was still in the field of uh, protein biochemistry but very new techniques very new questions very new projects and uh, from there i got this job um like 6 months ago to start working in massachusetts biologics as a downstream process scientist but yeah like i said it's not something that i always knew it's something that um something that i realized over time that this is what i like right uh, and i i enjoy the idea of coming up with solutions to different problems and the happiness that you get every time you solve that problem uh that can be your motivation to stay in this field because otherwise um uh, working in the field of research can be a big headache for people who do not enjoy this because you need a lot of patience to stay and work in this field you need a lot of patience you need a lot of perseverance perseverance to stay okay. and work in this field and if you don't have that even the person with the highest iq cannot survive and be a scientist because yeah. you need these things to survive in this field because it's a common saying in the field of science that you are like sometimes when i try to explain my work to my relatives and they come back to me that why are they even hiring you because you're working in a field where you fail like a hundred times to get one tiny step of success so right. if you cannot right. survive those hundred failures and that takes a personal toll on you even if mm-hmm. you are intellectually like out there you will not right. be able to enjoy this for a very long time and for you to be successful it this is something that is needed more than anything else right absolutely uh so from from what you just said i have got like two questions to ask you um first of all the way you said that you know initially when you went there you were not prepared like you did not know what research is and how does it work because in india uh, that's not how basically you know students are trained when they are doing their graduation like they are not given i don't because you know i am not from the science 
background so i cannot really uh quote exactly what happens but from what you just said i think yeah that that possibly that portion is missing that part is missing so if you could suggest maybe you know um, adding on some little things so that the students the students sort of you know the future generations they can just get a little idea what this is about so what would you suggest in that sense so um i would say that maybe i didn't have that kind of exposure uh, in getting hands on experience with research mm-hmm. um i did get a lot of theoretical um in terms of like theory and the concepts um i think my undergrad was good enough to build those concepts for me but i think the biggest thing that was lacking for me um was mm-hmm. that i didn't have any hands on experience on how research goes in terms of experiments or how, when you're working in the lab what kind of concept it is how do you start a project how do you come up with the questions that you want to address and then how do you because there's a lot of planning that goes into it before you actually start your projects um what kind of questions you want to address how you want to address them and right. when you have decided that what kind of experiments you want to do to build on your hypothesis and come on your come to your conclusions so i think mm. if you can get some hands on experience uh, for research that is something that can really help you to understand whether this is something you enjoy or not and um, mm. i know that there are some prestigious universities in india who do give you this kind of uh, research experience it can be some of the iits it can be some of the government research institutes uh, where you can be an intern and you know just for some time um, forget about the monetary compensations and invest some time yes. in that research experience because at the end of the day if you are trying to commit for grad school you are committing the next 6 years of your life on mm-hmm. an average uh in us in the united states it takes like around 6 years for you to graduate so uh-huh. it's good to give 6 months of even if it is like free internships uh at these government research institutions it can let mm-hmm. you understand whether you want to invest the next 6 years of your life that's a very Absolutely. big time you are putting in some of the best years of your life yeah. where you can mold your career you're putting all that in grad school not knowing whether you'll be able to finish so it's Absolutely. it's a good thing if you can have a glimpse of that by going to some of these research institutions which offer this kind of work and get some hands on experience with how research works so i think that right. can be something that people can do which is something i was not aware of at the time but mm-hmm. um that would have really helped me to understand um uh, how research operates and what kind of research should i invest in because when you apply to graduate school you are ultimately going to a particular lab and doing a particular kind of research and again mm-hmm. every lab is doing a very different kind of research and they are interdisciplinary yes but um uh-huh. at the end of the day your research has to click with you that has to be something yeah. that um that excites you that that question that, that you are trying to address has to excite you otherwise you will not be able to invest 6 years of your life in right. that work Absolutely. so i think if you can that go to these absolutely. academic institutions uh, if you can go to these government research institutions and get some hands on experience before you jump into graduate school i think that can really be an eye opener for you whether this is for you or not right absolutely uh, thanks for sharing that and i think that will be quite helpful to our future generations who are possibly you know thinking on taking that path okay so my next question for you is that the way you mentioned that you know there are a hundred failures and then that's when you actually see the results you see okay wow you know this has finally happened so yeah. could you maybe tell us your um that that feeling that you got for the very first time how was it and you know was it like a sigh of relief or were you like jumping with joy like what was it about <laughs> so i'll tell you how it is um the feeling that i had when my first publication came out um so i submitted this paper and you know you are thinking that you have put your heart and soul into this work and you've done some amazing <laughs> work and you are submitting this to get published in a journal now uh-huh. um 
just to ensure the integrity of your work and to ensure that what you're trying to publish is real and you know mm-hmm. because there is always a scope of manipulation that people who don't want to do the work in the right way you don't want that kind of work getting published because your work defines somebody else's work your once you publish something that's not mm-hmm. just you somebody else is going to try and build on the work that you published and that is how their research is going to go so it's very right. important in the field of science that your work whatever you're trying to publish before it goes online it has to be reviewed by your peers who don't right. know you it has it has to be anonymous um so okay. you submit your work to a journal and then the journal randomly sends it to some of the people uh, who are experts in this field and uh, i submitted my journal my first publication and i was so excited and then it comes back with these like reviews now the job of a reviewer is to butcher your work and uh, give you ideas on how you can make it from what you have been because when you keep working on something you start looking at it a particular way they are going to look right. outside that realm and try to make it better and it came back with these reviews and i was like oh my god they want so much more work from me and okay. my 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 uh, pi who's like my boss you call them pi's because they're the principal yep. investigator of the lab she said this okay. is very normal let's start building on this story and then that paper finally got published and i remember that i was sitting in my lab and every 5 minutes i would just type my name and the first word of my publication and then it would just show up my name would show up on google scholar and <laughs> and i would just keep looking at it and i'm like okay i'm i'm there i'm there people can see me they can find me if they just type my name and the first word yeah. of my publication it shows up like people can really find me and i kept doing that and then uh-huh. for the next many days i kept checking my google scholar because every time somebody uses your work for something they you get a citation uh-huh. that's how google scholar um informs you of how much impact your work is having and how much right. people are following your work and quoting that in your in their work that they worked on a project based on the idea that you developed and that you i worked. kept huh. typing my name every morning uh thinking mm-hmm. oh did i get a citation did i get a citation and not realizing that it just got published so somebody has to work based on this yeah. work and it's going to be another year before i can actually start seeing citations but the idea that i could just find my yeah. name online uh it's it's very hard to explain but it it gives you this satisfaction okay 3 years of my my first publication was at the end of 3 years of my grad school and i was like okay 3 years are now online yeah. people can see yeah. that i have been doing something for the last 3 years and Absolutely. that happiness <laughs> is what drives you to keep doing this over and over wow that's you know that's such a little you know you have shared just a little part of your life but i'm so glad and the way you just mentioned it and expressed it i i can i can somehow imagine that you know how it would have been like you know waking up every morning and just typing in your name so for how many days you did it like do you remember was it like a week 10 days 2 weeks <laughs> Oh I kept doing it for a very long time because I wanted to check the citations so I would keep typing my name and seeing if there any citation has come has anybody worked and uh-huh. there was a time I was like maybe nobody wants my work like oh, nobody okay. is reading my work and I was like maybe what I did is just for the sake of me doing it and nobody really cares that everybody is moving on their field without really considering my work and then you get your first citation and I'm like okay yeah. somebody believes what I did somebody believes in me that that's how you start thinking about it that somebody out there yeah. in the entire world who doesn't know me has no personal interest in me is not a friend of mine thinks yeah. that my work is good other than me my friends and my bo- my pi there is somebody out there uh-huh. who thinks my work is good <laughs> and and you're happy oh. with that and then your citations start coming and you oh, you realize okay this this is how and it's like okay it's going to happen <laughs> no i i still sometimes you know i think every month once at least i would just open my google scholar to see if there is uh-huh. any change in the number of citations that i have and every time i get one i'm still very yeah. happy about it I'm yeah, I'm very absolutely. happy like I told my uh, friends that once I cross 50 I'm going to open a bottle once I cross uh-huh. 75 I'm going to open a bottle 
and it just keeps, <laughs> it just keeps you going that you know absolutely absolutely and this is one thing that you know it's out there now and yeah. it's going to be there like it's 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 the shelf life of this thing that you have done it's just you know forever <laughs> more yeah. or less yeah It's, so yes uh, these uh, citations will keep uh, coming I, in and i hope that you know you get to open that bottle very soon <laughs> now next mark is 150 that's what i'm looking for next uh, i'm sorry i missed i'm okay. saying the next bottle is going to be when i hit 150 that's what i'm looking for perfect sounds awesome <laughs> all right so on that note let's move to our next question for you so you have mentioned about you know how all of this happened and how somehow the things worked and there you were in us so um moving to us what kind of a cultural shock did you you know go through like how was it because i am pretty sure that you know it's quite different from what it was here and how it is there so could you maybe just go back in your past and tell us about maybe your first few days your first week or your first yeah. month <laughs> i'll uh, i i remember this very clearly because uh-huh. uh, you know when you apply to united states there's this image of united states that's portrayed in your mind um mm-hmm. which is based on like big cities like new york city california whatever you see in the movies that's the only way you have actually seen what united states is and uh, right you come with the same kind of, everybody comes with the same concept in mind that we're going to live uh-huh. a, a life where which is what it looks like in movies i used to make this right. joke with people that you know people back home think that you know every day i get down and there is a lamborghini standing outside my house i'm going to sit in that and i'm going to just drive away <laughs> and enjoy this luxurious <laughs> life that has been given to me and then you land right. here and you realize that there are other places than new york city and the casinos and california and all this beautiful picture that has been portrayed in your mind so i right. ended up in a place called stores so um okay i joined university of connecticut uh connecticut mm-hmm. is uh the state which is adjacent to new york and it's it's between massachusetts and new york and mm-hmm. uh the way the university is built so there are different types of universities here some are built in the city itself so they are scattered okay. like you know you'll have one building of uh, your university here and then the other one is somewhere but then um, i ended up in a university which was like the whole university is built in one place so like uh-huh. even in the 6 years i have not seen every part of the university is that big like you oh, have to wow. drive around you cannot walk around and see the entire university you have to drive around to see the entire university um but oh. at the end of the day because you need that kind of space to be to build a university like that it's built far away from every place that you <laughs> can imagine that you can party and enjoy it's built in the middle of nowhere i'm talking about oh. like you know they basically found this patch and they're like oh there is nobody around this and let's build the damn thing here so <laughs> and i'm and you reach there and you realize that you know especially for me i'm coming from a city where i think uh, noise is music to us over time uh-huh. daily daily noise is music to us i landed there and i told my my cousin had dropped me to the university and i told him after a week that the silence is deafening me i need something loud in my ears to feel normal i i don't know how to behave here and he was like you know wow. it will it will grow up on you and then i yeah. landed up in my international students orientation and uh-huh. <laughs> i i i still laugh about this because they uh, have the, had this picture of new york city yeah. and california and this and they were like this is what you wanted to come for and then they had okay. a picture <laughs> of my university in the middle of just a forest and inside that is the university this is where you have landed okay so please understand <laughs> where you wanted to go and where you have landed there, there is a big oh. difference between that and that was like the biggest cultural shock that i had was okay that life <laughs> that i was imagining there is so <laughs> much more to it than what i was thinking and then you start having other cultural shocks like you know um you have never lived independently like, at least i had not lived independently 
understanding um, how to do grocery shopping the first time i landed in a grocery store i had no clue how you what am i what to buy to what to buy <laughs> like uh, i don't know how to start a a house where i have nothing i have to start i don't even have a spoon in the house and i have to start from there and then your friends take you to a grocery store and they're like you buy you go and buy two three things because in india people still have the tendency to buy uh groceries by a daily basis and here people uh, right. do groceries by weekly basis or a monthly basis so i picked up three things oh. and i came back home and i was thinking okay somebody will take me to a grocery store uh-huh. again they're like oh you should be done for a week and i have nothing to eat now and oh. i'm just ordering dominos <laughs> to just survive wow so, so that kind of things everybody faces like you don't know what you're landing into and then you know all those hardships of learning how to cook i uh-huh. i i still remember calling my sister and telling her that i think even before i finish grad school i'm going to die of hunger i'll be a malnourished <laughs> child by the time i come back and you're going to have to just nourish wow. me back to health because if i keep eating what i'm trying to make i'm surely going to kill myself oh, wow <laughs> so how much time did it actually take for you to get sort of you know be like okay all right this is happening this is how it is and yeah basically so how much time <laughs> it took me a whole year to accept uh, wow that you know this is what i want to build on like my first month i remember calling my um, dad and telling him i'm taking the flight tomorrow and i'm coming back i am i oh. don't care i am taking a flight tomorrow and i'm coming back because i don't think i can survive here and then he was like no give it 6 months because you're already mm-hmm. there on a scholarship it's not like you know you're paying it out of your pocket give it 6 months and see if you like it yeah and i was like okay give it 6 months and then you start getting the hang of it you you start building your connections for especially here your friends are your family because you've already left your family far behind so yeah, you start yeah. building when i say you start making connections you start building your family here those mm. friends are your family and you start building those connections and then you start seeing the good aspects of it you start enjoying yeah. um the feeling of living as an individual uh maturing to understand that you know everything that you're doing has some repercussions and how you have to deal with your situation to survive so it takes a full year just to develop those survival skills because you know i i grew up in a culture where you know i was always nurtured and nourished and i'm not the elder sibling i'm the younger sibling uh-huh. so i was i all i thought like i was always in this cocoon and i i was always safe I didn't have to make decisions for myself. I could always blame it on other people and say, "Oh, you made this decision for me." And <laughs> now I have to make every decision on my own and I'll have to live up with the decisions that I'm making because there is nobody to blame. I took the decision Absolutely. and I have to live with it. Absolutely. If I, if I am cooking something and burning it, then it is my responsibility to eat that as well. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> wow. So, um would you say that you know moving to another country it's more like a bitter sweet kind of a thing because you end up obviously you know leaving your family behind and there you are in a new country and um how often do you visit like how often do you come back it's more like once a year once in two years or something like that and that too i think maybe for 20 25 days or so yeah. for majority of your life you are there so does that sort of you know cuz sometimes uh like you know pull the strings of your heart does that happen with you or have you accepted it that yeah i think it happens with everybody um you have to be like really stone cold to not have that feeling uh you go through all these feelings of um uh, you know oh i left my family behind um i sort of shirked my responsibilities on them um you go through you also go through this feeling of leaving your country behind you feel like oh the country that gave me so much that that made me who i am today i left that behind uh what is my contribution uh-huh. to all this am i being a selfish person you go yeah. through all these feelings and it takes a lot of time to understand that at the end of the day mm-hmm. you and your life is just your life when when you're when like 
this is what i think you know if i have children that you know if i am their parent i have to make them understand that if i am nurturing them they don't owe anything back to me at the end of the day once they can make their own decisions they become an individual and that's where their life becomes and they have to go where they, wherever their life is taking them uh-huh. um, i'll always be there to love them but it's not necessary to be around me when i'm old because it's like you know it, this is how nature is uh, even like yeah. a tiny bird when they have uh, their their babies they ultimately yeah. want them to fly away and make their own life yeah create a life of their own nature is create a yeah. life of their own it doesn't necessarily have to be with the mother and father you ultimately become an individual and your parents right. job Absolutely. is to train you to become a good individual and from there yes. you move on and you build a life of your your own and it takes yes. a lot of time to to accept that because um it's not something that was culturally ingrained in me it's always yeah. been a feeling that you know uh, we are our parents support when they're old and i still believe in that but there can be many other ways to support your parents unfortunately uh-huh. i cannot be around them but i can still make sure that i still yeah. give them uh this feeling that whenever you need me i'll find a way to come back right and absolutely that is the only thing that can keep you sane as well otherwise this guilt feeling it sometimes you know takes over you that you know you have left your family behind and um yeah it comes and goes it still comes and goes but over time you realize that you know you are an individual now and you mm. have to build your own life right absolutely wow thank you for sharing that part of your life with us lipakshi and you know letting us in in your sort of you know your personal <laughs> space and really thank you for that so now sort of you know let's switch to the conversation about your work what is it that you exactly do and if you could could just you know let us understand it a bit would be awesome <laughs> okay so i'll try to keep it as simple as i can so uh-huh. um my phd training was in the field of uh, cannabinoid pharmacology so you know um the whole idea was that you know everybody talks about marijuana especially more so nowadays because uh, you know us many states in united states are making it legal to use it uh the whole idea was that um the work that i was doing mostly was we were trying to con- to build on the concept that every time you have marijuana you have these munchies and you really want to eat and why is that happening is because it triggers these receptors in your body which which basically aggravates your appetite so we were trying to okay. do it in a reverse way to basically you know cash it for a therapeutic advantage if this receptor can basically make you want to eat if you try to uh-huh. inhibit this particular drug uh-huh. point you can actually create a drug for anti obesity because you can reduce the appetite in people that really really want to eat all the yeah. time so how can you uh-huh. manipulate this basic pharmacology or this basic system in your body and what we were trying to do is we were trying to build analogs analogs is like versions of marijuana which can mm-hmm. somehow switch off this system in your body and then can we can use this and manipulate the system to reducing the appetite uh, especially in people who have uh, obesity issues okay and that was what my project was to come up with uh, new analogs and it it works in a collaboration we have a chemist and i was the bio- biologist in this project the chemist was synthesizing different versions and then i was testing them in cell system to evaluate if um this can truly okay. um reverse that signaling for this drug target and based on that we were able to come up with some very interesting analogs um uh, yeah. which can work as potential anti obesity drugs that was my um, phd work and then uh-huh. um in my postdoc uh, i thought that i want to know more about these drug targets rather than manipulation mm. of the signaling i wanted to understand the 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 drug targets in greater details so that once you understand the target better you know how to manipulate the targets better 
so uh, in my post doc i started learning more about protein purifications and it okay. was that training for protein purifications is for which i was hired for this position all right here they're trying to use that skill that i learned for protein purification in a very different manner uh, mm-hmm. i'm downstream protein process development scientist my job is to purify these proteins for clinical trials so um the field of science has moved from small molecule based drugs to biologics such as antibodies which can be used for therapeutic purposes like even mm-hmm. for covid-19 right, that is currently going on some of the treatments that they are trying to build are based on antibodies which can go and bind to uh, the covid-19 targets that people are trying to hit and neutralize okay. that so my job is that once you find these antibodies or these biologics how are, am i going to purify that and uh, clear it of all the endotoxins which well, if you inject it in a human being it can trigger certain mm. reactions so my job is to mm-hmm. purify it so that it can go into manufacturing for clinical trials so i am okay. in the late stage development of um, these projects as once you have identified a hit how are you uh-huh. going to make it into something that can be actually injected in a human being and you have to there is a lot of ex, uh, sensitive purification so i optimize the whole setup for them uh-huh. and then i transfer that intellectual information to the manufacturing team and then they okay. follow that protocol that i have designed to manufacture this uh and the protocol is designed in a way that enough to be injected in a uh, human being so it's mostly for clinical trials in the last stage when you want your product to go into clinical trials you have uh-huh. to purify that biologic and my job is to for every new biologic that comes uh, my job is to purif- optimize the purification process and then move it forward to the manufacturing team and that's all right in a nutshell that's what my job is you mentioned that you are um... your grad study was about marijuana and you know all of those things so it's just you know it's i'm i'm just a layman and you know i uh, not knowing how it really happened so were you working on the actual marijuana or were you working on like you know the extracts or how was it you know um, i used to have these undergrads who would come and ask me the same question that do you need volunteers <laughs> <laughs> for uh, your lab uh, how is it going and i used to make this uh-huh. joke to them yeah, because our lab used to stay locked because when you're working on drugs of abuse your doors have to be locked by key codes all the time okay. um so i used to tell them yeah once we we walk we walk to the lab in the morning we have to you know really create the aura and then we start <laughs> but um uh, <laughs> Uh, no so we used to work with extracts um these extracts can be bought and manipulated so like i said um in the field of science one lab never uh-huh. does everything you're always working right. with someone there's always a collaboration that is going on because if you try to do everything by yourself you might not be able to get anything out there for the next 10 20 years you're always working mm-hmm. with other labs like even one project can have like three four labs running at the same time doing different parts of the project that they have expertise in and have the okay. uh, instrumentation and supplies for it because um okay. all that this work that goes into it every instrument that you're working with is very very expensive um so one academic lab for one academic lab to have everything yeah. is almost impossible you're mm-hmm. always working in collaborations so um we were working with um a medicinal chemist who would buy the original um like the extract that you say and then ultimately the job was to uh through uh, manipulations with chemistry make these different versions of that um we're not going to okay. inject marijuana into people we're making these analogs that can ultimately be synthesized in a lab because eventually if you want this to go um into like drug dosage you're not going to constantly you know go grow marijuana and then take extracts from that yeah. you basically build this yeah. whole plant medicinal chemistry platform where you can synthesize them in the lab and uh, manipulate okay. them in the lab and then whatever the 
my job was to actually figure out if these manipulations really work in um, in uh, cell based assays or not because you know there's a big process from things going from lab into cells then into tissues then into animals and then it goes to human beings so my part was to figure out which analogs actually are going to have a possibility of working so you put them into systems and see how the signaling gets manipulated as different analogs are being built so our collaborator um, was in texas and he used to synthesize these versions he used to send it to us then we would test them then we would come back with uh, based on the data that we would generate we would come back with a hypothesis okay these manipulations are shifting or uh, shifting the signaling in a particular direction and we want it to go in this direction so let's try the, these kind of an, in analogs and you go back and forth consistently with your collaborators and you throw ideas out there and then you have to think about practical considerations can the the chemist actually synthesize this uh so we go mm-hmm. back and forth on all these things and then we come up with new ideas and you go you do you do this for many years because like i said it took me 3 years to get my first publication so it took me 3 years to find an analog that was interesting to publish um and before that you know i screened like hundreds and thousands of analogs before we came up with this one that was interesting to us that we thought that would be something interesting to publish out there and the way it mm. behaved the way it manipulated the signals in the um uh, in the cell based assays and what it could potentially mean when it could be out there as a therapeutic drug what implications it's going to have so you you go through all these things to find label this but it's not like we have plants that we are extra you mm. do that there are labs that actually do that kind of work to there was a lab at ucon where um this professor actually used to go on um like she, she used to do deep sea diving to uh find okay. these interesting weeds uh, and interesting plants which are there like marine life has a lot of uh, interesting anti, um, antibiotics that they synthesize to keep themselves good in underwater system mm. so she used to collect these bring them back to the lab and then they would extract these chemicals out of their system and then test them to figure out if there is any interesting antibiotic that can be uh, taken from these and once they have that structure now they can synthesize it in ah. their lab so there are labs that do this and this was something that was done for marijuana like a very very long time ago so um uh, that is why there is already a known structure for um thc which is the active constituent ah. of marijuana so yeah i didn't uh-huh. have to do that part but yes there are labs that do this kind of work as well all right all right so uh my next question for you here would be that um did you choose to sort of you know work on this or how did that happen like was it your choice or was this what your uh, lab was working on so you were a part of and that's how you sort of you know became a part of this so how did that part happen so um so let me give an idea of how research and academic institutions operate here because i think that is something that i wasn't aware of but it really helps for people to figure out what kind of labs they want to apply to so mm-hmm. most of the labs here they they are uh, the funding in universities comes from uh, private funding and also government based okay. funding like the national institute of health which is uh, the primary uh, funding agency here um so all these labs in academic institutions they write these grants where the principal investigator which is technically your boss um the principal mm-hmm. investigator who's a professor running the lab um has a certain mm-hmm. he has this vision and some ideas about like big visions of how he wants to build a project what kind of questions he wants to address and how it will mm-hmm. in like you have to um somehow convince these people uh to fund them in a way that how this will uh impact like public health or any other field that you're trying to like in my field it's mostly public health like how it is going to improve public health or how is it going to improve our understanding so that overall eventually in many years down the line this understanding and the concepts that you figure out can improve public health so the the okay. pi writes these grants along with students to train them okay and they apply okay. to these agencies 
uh, like National Institute of Health. And then these agencies, uh, they review these grants. And again, it goes through peer review where it goes to other people who are experts in the field and they have to go through your grant and give scores for that. And based on that, your lab gets a grant. Now this money has, okay. uh, this money will include different aspects like money for the grad student salary, money for the grad student's tuition fee, money for all the supplies that go into the project, um, the instruments mm -hmm. that go into the project. And it comes with a certain deadline, which depends on the kind of scholarship and the money you're applying. There can be 10 year grants, there can be five year grants, depending on how big the project is. Um, okay. So the PI comes up with a vision and some questions that they want to address. And that is how okay. you start. He tells you when you join the lab, they give you these questions because, you know, you, you're coming from undergrad, you're doing basic subjects and basic research in the sense that you're learning how to use these instruments, but you're not going to sit and come suddenly come up with, oh, I want to answer this question in the field of science. And it's not just like some lightning strikes your brain and you come up exactly. with that question. No. So it is initially okay. your PI and that is what, uh, your training in grad school is about your PI comes up with these questions that they want you to address. So mm. they want you to start thinking on how you're going to address these questions with the instruments that are available here, or maybe the collaborations that the lab has or potential collaborations right. that you can find. So you initially start to learn how, when a question comes, how do you address that? That is the biggest thing okay. that you learn in grad school is how you're going to work and answer and figure out if this hypothesis is real or not. So that's how you start. But mm -hmm. as you keep getting experimental data, things can uh -huh. go in different directions. It's not necessary that the hypothesis that your PI came up with is actually true because, you know, until unless and until it is experimentally done, you really don't know if it is true or not. You come up right. with an idea based on all these publications that you have read beforehand and it gives you a new idea. So when you're doing mm. your experiments, it can go in a different direction and you keep following that direction. Okay. And your hypothesis keeps changing over time. And, uh, and then ultimately you get a story. So yeah. there is a little bit of everybody here. The, the vision mm. comes from your PI, okay. uh, but you move the project to what it becomes eventually. It can ultimately yeah. be that your PI's hypothesis or vision was actually true or you mm -hmm. find something very new along the way and you keep following that. It's like that light, you keep following that and you can come up with something entirely different that nobody was aware of. Right. So it can go right. either way. So there is a little bit of you and there is a little bit of your boss, but you're not thrown there in a lab and given all these instruments and be like, oh, come up with something new. No, <laughs> that's not how right. There works. is a... <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But once you move from your PhD to your postdoc, um, people who want to be a professor. Hello. Um, I got a phone call. Yeah. <laughs> you ultimately have to, uh, the idea is when you they train you, your postdoc is your training to either you decide which way you want to go. You want to go in academics, you want to yeah. go in industry because there are two different main streams now. Uh, in industry, there is, um, you know, the projects are profit driven. The whole idea is that what you can bring to the market that can impact public health very soon. And academia works on long term projects where the mm. concept is being built from scratch and all this academic work comes together and builds something big. Um, so if you wow. want to go in the field yeah. of academia, the postdoc is your biggest training because that's when you start applying for grants yourself. So all the training that you got during PhD, you start coming mm -hmm. up with your own questions that you want to address in your field or something that you read that excites you and you know you can do that kind of work. So uh -huh. people start applying for their own grants when they're in postdocs or own fellowships, own scholarships that fund your postdoc. And at mm -hmm. the same time, your PI also has uh, fundings that, that is how you get hired yeah. as a postdoc to begin with. So that is a good training for people who want to move in the field of academia. That postdoc gives you that opportunity to start applying for grants for yourself that you can take and start your own wow. lab. Yeah. Or you can choose to go into industry where there is already uh, a vision that the company has and then you can right. find your way around that. 
so it's right. a choice you sort of become a part of it but yeah you are still sort of creating your own way but yeah it's yeah. sort of you are already a part of a bigger picture but yes it's right. sort of in place yeah yes it, it's more placed uh, in that sense that things are faster in industry so um, mm-hmm. the academia works on slow and steady wins the race um, and yeah. industry is like what can we bring to the table that can start impacting and improving public health like tomorrow or in a year or so right so that's why the kind of work that i am doing right now i know that uh-huh. i will be in this lifetime able to see that change in clinics yeah that that thing is yeah. going to change something while i'm living in the field yeah. of academia all that work that i did in my phd uh uh-huh. these are foundations that i have built which will take many years and many people from across the globe working yes. together to build something big yes it will be fruitful yeah, yeah. one day but i don't know when but in industry you know that your work is that like your projects change so fast that you know that uh-huh. it's going to come out very soon you'll be able, you'll yeah. be able to see your work out there impacting public health very mm-hmm. soon so if that is what drives you then industry is your go your your way to go which is what was my right. case that's why i wanted to join the industry yeah actually i was just uh, you know about to ask you the same question that how does that make you feel that you know you are doing something day in and day out which is majorly you know working towards public health and was that one of the reasons that you actually chose this part like was it a conscious decision and Initially, something that you chose because of this so initially it was uh, you know all you always have that feeling uh, um you know for uh, it can be personal reasons family reasons that you see um you lose family members to um things and you you have this mental thing in the back of your mind that maybe someday i'll change this what if i would have done something to change this yes that is always yeah. a there in your subconscious mind that there, there is always that driving factor um uh-huh. but your motivation to stay in this field constantly keeps changing over time there was also a okay. time when uh, monetary compensations became a, mon- uh, a motivation factor and i'm not going to deny that um it's just not enough to survive in this field yes there will be monetary compensations but there has to be something bigger than that for you to survive in this field um right and and that motivation like i said it keeps changing over time and it should change and you know over mm-hmm. time i started having this feeling that i want to work in the industry because i want to see that change coming soon and um mm. like you know when this this pandemic began and um, uh-huh. there was an opportunity in my company to work on the covid-19 related projects i was very excited about that because i knew what i'm doing is going yeah. to impact or it is going to have an impact right now and uh, that that feeling uh, is very driving for me and you have to have that feeling to survive in industry um mm. i'm not uh, at the same time i'm not saying that the research in academia is not impactful because uh-huh. um it is the foundation uh, of research is built by academics they are the ones right. that invest many many years of research to find those basics which is what industry builds their projects on so right. uh, they both have their own place you just have to choose which direction you want to go and right. most of the times i have seen that um not just me like all my peers and colleagues that i have seen most of the times by the time you are at the end of your grad school you have a very good idea of which direction you want to go because uh these are two mm. very different personalities you have to have these are very very different personalities and that is why it's they're very polarized in that sense and you know that if you want to be an academic or whether you want to be in industry you get that clarity same, yeah you you do get the clarity at the same time I'll, i'll also like to mention that you don't have to be scared about this when you're finishing grad school that you chose academics you cannot go to industry you chose industry you cannot go to academics because i've seen people doing both i've seen okay. um people who worked in industry for many years and mm-hmm. they came back to academia because they wanted um 
they they were in that field working for so many years and they came up with some things that they wanted to address and they wanted to do it their own way so they came back to academia okay. applied for these grants and started running their own labs to address those questions because it's not necessary oh, wow. in industry that you know you have come up with this question and industry mm-hmm. wants to invest in that right now so people have moved from industry to academia and vice versa as well i've also seen people who um got into academia because you know since childhood they wanted to be a teacher or a professor and yeah. um then they realized the grunt work that goes into academia because when you're mm-hmm. running an academic lab you have to remember that when you're applying for these grants there are five uh-huh. or six people in that lab whose salary uh-huh. relies solely on you getting that grant mm-hmm. so can you live with that kind of pressure that if you lose the grant you're going to have to tell these people back there that i'm sorry i don't have a grant wow. so i cannot really pay your salary and you're going to wow, have to find yeah. something else some people are thr- some people thrive on this because uh hmm. they feel happy to know that they are molding the next yeah. generation for them right. that is a big driving factor which is something i've seen in my pis that they were always happy to know that they are molding the future of the next generation and that was their driving factor and that's why they're great as professors so but yes there is always a possibility to change sometimes you jump into being a professor and then you realize that you don't enjoy that kind of pressure that responsibility uh-huh. that it comes with its right that you are the master of your lab you are your yeah. own boss but at the same uh-huh. time it comes up with the responsibility that everybody in this lab is looking up to you for mentorship for guidance for their career counseling your pis are your career counselors as well so they are looking uh-huh. up to you for all these things so yeah. if you enjoy that um you can be excellent as a professor if you don't enjoy yeah. that and but you still enjoy science and you want to do your work then industry is a good choice to go for right wow lipakshi i think you know uh, the way you have sort of explained it and i think you have put a lot of mind that ease in that sense because you know people who will be watching this later on because this will be posted everywhere and you know there are people who are looking for this kind of information and i think things that you have just said it is going to help a lot of people out there that first of all you know you have taken that fear out of the complete equation that if you choose one you cannot switch to the other like yeah. with very good examples you have just you know made it very easy that if you want to sort of you know switch that possibility is there it's not the end of the world if you are there and if you don't like it you can definitely jump to this side and if you are here you can jump to this side so i have to sort of you know thank you for sharing that information and considering that yeah i i'm pretty sure that you know it is going to help a lot of people at least you know some bit of people out there who are looking for this information yeah and uh just because we are sharing information i also want to mention about this because uh this is something that i came to know more in the later half of my grad school when you join grad school um uh, research is not the only field that you're limited to because okay. uh, there are a lot of people who are going through grad school and they realize that there are other fields out there that they can be better suited for and mm-hmm. if you join research there it's not like you have shut doors on everything else and if you realize that bench work and experimental work is not something that that motivates you for a long time there are other fields that people readily want to hire phd's for in the field of uh, medicinal chemistry biological sciences um for example you can go into the field of law there are so mm-hmm. many um agencies that hire you as patent specialists because these companies are always working with patent lawyers but at the end of the day patent lawyers uh like most of these lawyers only have a degree in the field of law but they don't understand the scientific aspect of it so you can be hired as a patent advisor where every time a new case comes when they have to understand the scientific uh, information uh, yeah. that is something that a patent advisor can uh, guide these lawyers for so that you can build the case accordingly so every company has these patent as advisors as well so that is also a field you can look into um there mm-hmm. are other fields like management consultancies so all these management consultancies also have a lot of um, 
they also have a special life sciences fields where they exclusively want to hire phd's who have a very good understanding of um how research operates ultimately you're not going to be doing research but they want people to have that understanding and they will groom you for the management yeah. aspect of it because um mm, something yeah. that I, uh, because i went to all these career counseling sessions to really decide which way i want to go um the okay. concept that management consulting people have right now is that um you can train a scientist to become a manager but to train a manager to learn the science is it's not that easy because it it takes many many years so a lot of management yeah. consultancy especially for the field of life sciences medicinal chemistry these fields they have started hiring scientists and they groom you for the management aspect of it um uh, because they mm. know you already have a very strong hold on the scientific aspect so they start grooming you for the management aspect and then you are that perfect candidate for them so other yeah. than research there are all these opportunities that you can uh, dive into if during your grad school you realize that you like science you like the idea of problem solving but you don't want to do experimental work or you don't want to be at the bench forever and there are a lot of people who move into these fields so those fields are out there for you so you don't have to worry yeah. jumping into grad school thinking that oh i've already it's it's not a marriage that you have done for life <laughs> like so, there's a way out <laughs> there is a, there is a way out um and Stop you know supervising. <laughs> right there is it's yeah. it's not that you have made a decision for life um you can always yeah. move around and you can take whatever you have learned in grad school and all those soft skills that you have developed over time be it be presenting in front of um, 200 people who are experts in the field and not being scared that is also something you get trained in the field, in grad school is because you have to keep presenting your okay. work at different mm. for- forums not knowing what questions they're going to come up with so you're trained for all these soft skills that you develop you can take these in the many different fields uh, it's not just research that you have to be restricted to if over time you realize that your personality fits better into these roles right wow well, lakshmi really you know thank you for putting in that part in this conversation also and yeah i think that's again you know again a very helpful point that you have covered all right so now yeah, i, I want to talk about your sessions to get this yeah <laughs> absolutely so uh, what i wanted to ask you next is that um you were talking about the publications part right so how many publications you have had so far and how much time does it usually take okay um so publications depends on the field that you're working in um there are fields where uh, people graduate with 10 publications and there are fields that people graduate with one publication because every field has its own pace um mm. and and um, your pi's know very well about this it there is never a um, a standard for the entire university that you have to graduate with so many publications there are people who graduate okay. without publications as well um because it, all it means is that you know you have already done a good chunk of work um right. which is part of your thesis but it's not ready to be online yet for many reasons maybe your uh, pi is interested in uh, filing a patent for this so he's not going to publish this out there till a patent is there so there can be many reasons for that so uh, in my field uh, like when i graduated i graduated with four publications but at the okay. same time from my lab there were people who graduated with six publications there were also people who graduated with two publications at the end of the day your advisor is the one who understands because he's working with you on a day to day basis like mm-hmm. in my lab my pi had like 7 8 people so she is the boss of 7 8 people she has to go and talk and manage these 7 8 people so she's talking to you almost yeah. on a daily basis so your pi yeah. has a very good understanding of how much work you are doing how much efforts you are putting are you getting groomed in the right way does she think that you're ready to graduate do you understand yeah. how research goes so the publication number really mm-hmm. uh, cannot be defined uh, it varies okay. from lab to lab as well even okay. in the same field okay. every lab's work can be different and 
your pi's expectations of the publication that you graduate will will depend on the kind of work that she is doing he or she is doing right so um i just want to ask you one more question here that uh, do you like uh, can you still publish or do you like is that something that you can still work on or do you want to work on that how does it happen or does it sort of you know end once you're done with your grad like how does so that it, work it never really ends um so even in my postdoc um so in my postdoc i got i did 3 years of postdoc i got one publication that came out like 2 months ago and okay. then i wrote a book chapter last year uh, which was okay. about you know the book chapter was about uh, writing the protocols that we have established in our labs in easy terms for somebody who doesn't have that kind of uh, setup in their labs how do you set that up and you can just read and get your experiments done so i wrote a book chapter last year i still have a publication that is going to come because you know you leave your work but the work doesn't end there there is yeah. somebody else who's going to pick up that work once you leave um mm-hmm. so th- hopefully by the end of this year that publication is going to come um, okay. you get more publications in um, academia as a phd or a postdoc or even if you work as a scientist uh-huh. in universities you always get more publications uh, okay. because academics thrive on the idea of publishing their work uh, that is uh-huh. how they get their next grants is the number of publications that they're putting the kind of work it it is mostly open source most of the work that goes okay. from universities is open source unless they want to patent their work um in industry okay. most of the work is for patents or something that uh, all the intellectual property belongs to the uh, company so everything doesn't get published or the publications right. don't come as fast as what you would see in academia because the industry is trying to keep their intellectual property to themselves unless and until they put a patent hold on it that mm. doesn't mean that industries don't publish they do publish but um uh, their motivation is more to get things into the clinic or ah. you know getting things out there because that is how companies make money but academics mm-hmm. uh they make money by getting these grants for which you have to have publications so the motivation uh kind of differs so you get more publications when you are in academia than industry but you keep getting okay. them through your life all right so that will for you know just the publications will keep happening you'll keep waking up in the mornings and just you know checking <laughs> your name oh yeah citations yeah. and all you know that's going to happen <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely all right um so by the way i can see that you know one of my dog has decided to join in the session and he's just sitting <laughs> behind me and he you know sort of sometimes he just keeps speaking so yeah <laughs> that's fine uh so all right on that note uh what i want to discuss next with you is uh that you know considering the pandemic that the entire world is going through the global crisis that each one of us is literally facing day in and day out so yeah. how does that sort of you know affect how has that affected your work and how has your work life been in past 3 4 months and could you maybe just you know share that part and how crazy it is or you know all of it so uh, you know i mean things came to a halt in like everywhere uh, once this pandemic hit but in terms of my work um because my company was working on projects related to covid-19 i never stopped going to work um no. but and, but you know my company had to make a lot of changes in their policies to ensure that there is sufficient social distancing because you know they consider the it their responsibility that if you're coming to work to do all these um projects for them it's their responsibility to make sure that you stay healthy and you know we are we are in the field of life sciences and healthcare we are, we don't want to have policies that can affect our um people yeah. at the end of the day so for me i never stopped working even when there was lockdown i think in the initial part of the lockdown i did go in shifts where i worked for i did experiments for two days at a stretch okay. and then i stayed at home and i did all the analysis part at home which was not okay. something i was doing before before i was always <laughs> going to my office and even if it's their analysis section they yeah, the reporting and everything i was still doing that in the lab but right. that's the kind of policies that were changed because of covid-19 so we started yeah. working alternately okay um, 
and i think that's going to be the norm for a, a good chunk of time at least for now yeah. the way things look like i think every company has to work with these kind of policies my right. company um does my covid-19 uh viral testing every monday uh when i go to work oh. i get tested for that and then you know wednesday we have the results because this is the only way they can make sure that if people are coming right. to work uh and because i was already um actively working on a project related to covid-19 so i had to go to work mm-hmm. so i think for uh, the life sciences um people in the field of life sciences industry i think the work didn't stop we just had to yeah. find new ways to go back and do this work um be it be working in shifts constantly wearing masks in the lab which is something uh, it takes time to adjust to you know you're working on an experiment and your mouth is covered for like good 7 8 hours uh it's a struggle but uh, everybody knows that it's important uh, it's important for you it's, it's important for everybody else around you so companies came up with new policies they had to sit through and come up with ways that they could maintain social distancing and how they can keep the work going because yes there is one pandemic but there are uh, still a lot of other diseases that affect people and that is why all this research is going on for so many years right so you don't want to stop that research because there is another pandemic because you know you still need answers to those questions you still need therapeutics that can resolve those issues those diseases so the work has to keep going you just have to find new ways and companies are coming up with new ways to um re- like reduce uh, the spread and improve social distancing in workplace like most of the conferences even though i'm actually in my office uh, most of the conferences are on zoom even though we can go and sit in a room it's better to sit yeah. in your office and just do zoom conversations so people companies are coming up with these kind of policies and that has changed the work culture yeah. but i think that's something where it's the need of the hour and everybody has to do it it's not it's not a choice Absolutely. everybody has to do it yeah completely all right uh, so uh lebakshi the next question for you is that uh, it has been close to 10 years for you uh staying in the states nine those nine I, ca- i came on 7th august 2011 9 years. Oh wow, you remember exactly the date also and <laughs> you just mentioned yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. It, All right, so and uh, yeah, it's like right there. Yeah. All right, and when you were in India, you were working here as well. Like yes. you had some work experience. So could you yes. maybe just give us like you know two three pointers of the uh difference in the work culture? Uh difference like you know in just work this is there this is there <laughs> okay um so like i said the flexibility of time here most of the work is project driven so if you do your work it doesn't matter if you do it in 2 hours or you do it in 20 hours uh, most of the work is project driven and that is what guides your day to day life um another thing is something that um i realized after coming here is that we have this habit in india of you know always addressing people as sir and ma'am that, that's hmm. not a concept here um in fact i think initially i used to write emails to my pi like respected madam and then i would start my email and then slowly uh-huh. i started realizing people really don't do that and then, then i was like you know if i stop doing it she will sort of see that difference so i sort of phased <laughs> yeah. it out i phased it out okay uh, i started doing from respected madam emails to dear uh-huh. madam ma'am okay and then uh, ultimately because here like if i'm speaking to my boss i'm not going to call him sir or ma'am. i'm going to call him on first name basis it doesn't okay. matter what position be it be the director of the company or the president of the country everybody is called on their first name basis because just because you are in a senior position doesn't mean that um yeah you have a bigger status or something uh-huh. everybody is uh-huh. considered equal in that sense and um everybody is called on first name which is something i like uh, i like the That's idea right. um that you know you don't have to always call somebody sir and ma'am and consider that you are inferior to them in any way they're doing their job you're doing your job and whatever extra money they're making they're they're taking it to their house they're not giving it to me so i don't have to give them any extra respect more respect than what they're giving to me just because we are at yeah. different positions in uh-huh. the field so in in that sense um that's a good thing i think uh, the biggest thing is punctuality 
you know coming uh-huh. to work on time and what it means to uh, people in united states um, yeah. when somebody says that there is a meeting at 8 everybody yeah. is at the meeting by 7:50 that last 10 minutes is that buffer time because you cannot be 8:01 not that they're going to yeah. kill you for it uh, you know if you have a, a reason for it but you cannot say oh i was sleepy <laughs> or you know i was getting dressed even if you are saying that you had traffic you should better be prepared for that traffic because punctuality yeah. means a lot here to people that they okay. uh, they it's it's a sort of disrespect to make somebody wait the because no. you're basically you're you're they consider it that indirectly you're saying that their time is not as important as your time so in in right. work culture like punctuality is another thing that that had to slowly come to me over time and i had to okay. understand how people how important it is uh, to be punctual in terms of the time that you're giving to people if you're telling them you're going to be there you can tell them i'm not going to be there till 10 o'clock and they're fine with it but if you tell them yeah. you're going to be there at 8 and then you show up at 10 um, it's considered uh, disrespectful so that is a difference in work culture and that is something every i think that that's a good thing that everybody can uh-huh. absorb so yeah that is that's different in that sense yes all right so um it ha- like you have been there for 9 years 7th yeah. of august 2007 yeah <laughs> you still, are you like you know are you still as desi <laughs> um you know there's a running joke in my lab um people say uh, that um especially when i'm present like people say that when i'm talking to them um mm-hmm. they consider it normal in like in the sense how people talk around here but they say when i'm stressed they say uh-huh. that i suddenly start sounding like i'm fresh off the boat so it's a, that was like a running <laughs> joke in my lab every time i would stand for presentation especially in my postdoc lab i think um, uh-huh. people started like telling me this that you know when you stand for presentation if you're ready for it then you're going to sound normal but as okay. soon as you are <laughs> even a tiny bit stressed suddenly mm-hmm. it sounds like you came to united states just yesterday and we're making you stand here and talk <laughs> in an accent that they can understand so i think in that sense i'm still very lazy <laughs> that you know um, when i'm stressed i go back to my roots that somehow yeah. helps me <laughs> but other than that um maybe because you know i i came to united states at an age that you know some of the things are now so deep rooted that they're not going to change like for me uh-huh. indian food is still what i cook at home on a daily basis that that's what i want to eat right uh music um i still like to follow indian music i think in that sense i'm very very desi um okay <laughs> i think even yesterday I, i i i was doing this with my friend i found this app called cult which is very popular apparently in, in india uh-huh. and i It think until beginning. like Uh, and i think until th- 3 months ago when i tried to download that thing um people in united states did not have access to it because you needed an indian phone number for that and then i mm. figured out last week that you know they have connected it to facebook and even if you're in the united states you have access to it yeah. so i told my friend and yesterday i came back from work directly to her place i'm actually at her place today and uh, we uh-huh. turned that app on and it must be like 5 am classes in india and 7 7:30 in in united states perfect time for us to exercise yeah. and we turned that app and just because they were doing zumba classes and bollywood music we were so excited about it that oh my god like what what have we found like this this is my my finding for the day is that you know i found this app that plays bollywood music for uh uh zumba classes so yeah wow in fact, I remember what I remember this conversation that I went to this Zumba class at uh Yukon and um uh-huh. me and my friend um she's from the same undergrad school that I came from and we were attending this class and we were dancing and you know it's the second half of the class you're already drained and you've lost that energy and suddenly she played yeah. that song that Chikni Chameli for the Zumba class <laughs> and these two people me and my friend who are at the back of the class who who are losing the energy suddenly like suddenly found this energy and we were back on track with how we started the class the woman actually at the oh, end wow. of the class came and told me that you know when that last song played even though you were dying uh-huh. before that suddenly you guys were jumping 
you were faster than i was and i don't know what got into you and i'm like you know it's just a song it's the feeling that oh there's something that i can relate to so i think in that <laughs> sense i I'm, i'm still very daisy but yes yeah so a lot of things daisy, change yeah. in you over time your thought process changes the culture impacts you you impact the culture at the same time uh-huh. uh, it's not one way you bring something to the table and they bring something to you most of my friends like to know more about my culture and i think that's how that's how cultures infuse right into each other yeah. um absolute so yeah some things have changed in me i know that um mm-hmm. but at the same time there's some things that i want to hold on to because it makes me feel like i'm still connected in some way yeah some things that i purposely hold on to if i go to an indian grocery store i still want to buy a bag of chips from that grocery store because i know when i was a kid i liked having uncle chips not because there are no chips flavors here but i want to buy yeah. that just because it gives me that feeling that once i'll eat it i'll have that feeling that i'm back home so this goes it takes you back that, yeah and that's something i know everybody here does is it's just for the mm-hmm. sake of this that that familiar feeling uh is comforting yeah. to you so i think every international student that comes here does this purposely just because it it's soothing yeah. to them in some ways so it's But the kind yeah, of comfort you, that you learn something from yeah, yeah. yeah it's there because you know um when you are like when i came i was 23 plus there are some things that were already like i was set in my own ways and then you, uh-huh. you land up in a place where everything is different even uh, when you're crossing the road you're confused because the direction is different yeah. um yeah. yeah and it it actually confuses you for some time you're always walking in the wrong direction so uh uh-huh. because you know everything um you know for anybody when you take them out of their comfort zone and you put them in a new place they try to hold on to like they hold on to anything that that tiny bit also that you you feel like okay i know this i know this very well that is soothing Absolutely. to you so i think that's why uh, when people from uh different countries they move on to a new place if there is anything that they have access to that makes them feel that they are still connected or they understand mm. this this is a familiar feeling it's yeah. it's something they, they try to hold on to it purposely yeah. they try to hold on to it and right i do the same thing yeah so yeah you know when it's like bole mere lips i love uncle no i know <laughs> i i used to hate i used to hate uh chai in india uh i still hate i still hate chai it's something okay. i just never learned uh to enjoy that taste but I've learned to drink that because when I sit with uh people who are from India they enjoy tea and then I feel like oh I am outside that circle so out of that peer pressure I have learned to drink tea every time I go to some uh, person who's from India or Pakistan or Bangladesh because we are all yeah. people who yeah. really enjoy uh their they, they has to start with chai so I I in terms of that peer pressure have accepted that okay if i have to be part of the circle i have to learn how to have chai <laughs> so <laughs> right so yeah so wow. things that you you stay they say uh, about some things and there are some things that change and you don't even realize uh, that those things have changed in you uh, over right. time right absolutely so uh, lipakshi what are some of those things that you like to do whenever you come back like you know few things that okay i have to do this i have to eat this i have to da 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 so what are those maybe just you know give us like top three things that you have so, to have to do um you know this is a thing that everybody thinks that when you're far away from home the feeling that you miss the most is your family but uh-huh. the honest truth is the feeling that you miss the most is the food yes I it's think. always <laughs> the food that you miss the most not that you don't miss your family it's the food that you miss the most and that is what right. you're craving to go back to is just having the food. that uh, <laughs> the food yeah my my first time that i went back to uh, to india from united states was after a year and a half so this is a year and a mm-hmm. half where i'm struggling to cook here and i am really bad at it whatever i'm cooking i'm crying eating that thing and then i go back home and now i have access to all those things that i remember sitting with my um, relatives and we ordered some things on the table 
and then somebody was finishing uh, one of the shared items so i purposely took that on my plate because i was like oh this is i, I won't have an access to eat this so let me have this first and then i'll finish what i have on my plate because otherwise i won't get the chance to eat that thing so that that thing my my sister actually had to ask me are you like not having anything where i, I am just really confused at the way you are you're acting like a glutton who has not had food for a very long time because you're like fighting for that food oh you cannot finish the the gulab jamun on the table because i don't remember the last time i had one so you have to wow. keep some for me because i have to have everything i can and i even now i know most of my friends when they go back home be mm-hmm. any country that they're from everybody has this list of things that they want to eat before eat. they come back right. uh, that is that is always your yeah that's like an agenda that you have to finish uh-huh. and uh, in fact the last <laughs> time when i went to india i asked my uh, aunt to make this dish that i really like and uh-huh. i packed it in a box and i brought it back to united states so that when i land here and i don't have that food i'm going to eat that it's been packed wow. for two days <laughs> in my luggage bag and i'm still going to eat that because you know i i need to eat that so that that's always first thing on your list is the food that you're going to eat second you know uh not in any way less important is that i want to spend time with my family and friends um right and i think because of that reason whenever i come to india i usually don't go anywhere outside delhi or ncr yeah. per se because i want to be around and um yeah. when you come back home for such a short time um it's not just for them it's more for you that you right. stay uh with them as much as you can because all that feeling is what you're going to take back and that's going to let you survive the next two years or so when you're not going to yeah. be able to come back home so you right. try to absorb as much affection and attention and time that you can get from them because that is what is going to keep you sane for the next two years and not get you to this feeling that oh I'm guilty of staying away from my parents and family so you really yeah. really want to get as much of their time as you can <clears throat> so right. that's the right. second thing that you um, really um, have it on your agenda um yeah for me these two are the biggest agendas that mostly guides me the third thing is again related to food when i'm going back i have this list of things that i have to buy or <laughs> right. it can be like all these um some of the indian clothes that i want to take back for some ah. special occasions like holi and diwali um yeah. if there is a indian festival being celebrated here then i have to wear this uh, because here when they have festivals ah. like these it's an opportunity to show your indian wardrobe <laughs> so <Absolutely>. everybody <laughs> every and and people love uh, indian clothes here um i had um, these friends uh, in my postdoc lab they came to my house and they saw some of the dresses that people wear on indian weddings they thought that these are like wedding gowns and i was like no no i am still not married so these are not wedding gowns and oh. they were at my house and they just dolled themselves up with all the indian jewelry and clothing that they have and, and they took all these pictures and it was like portfolio sessions going on for a good half an hour because uh-huh. people love indian clothes here they they yeah. um, i i was actually uh, my cousin was celebrating diwali and i stopped by at a grocery store to pick up something on the way and i stepped down and it was very diwali comes very close to halloween and this lady stopped hmm. me and she's like where did you get this halloween dress from and i was like i got it shipped all the way from india it's a it's a dress <laughs> of a princess from india and she's like oh my god can we get it on amazon i'm like you can try wow <laughs> that's crazy the way, they have started selling indian clothes on amazon <laughs> really yeah oh, wow and they're not the best ones but you know it, it, it's it's interesting Something. that it's getting there yeah Yeah. I started getting things like idli stand on Amazon now. <laughs> that's that, quite that, good. That's many Indians have landed in United States and because <laughs> now we have impacted and infused our culture into theirs. <laughs> absolutely. Wow, Lipakshi, this has been absolutely an amazing session and I can't believe that, you know, we have almost talked for close to two hours actually. I know. Yeah, it's like, you know. <laughs> so uh, uh because you know we have like 10 minutes left and obviously you know otherwise we'll have to start the third session 
so before going to our very last um topic wherein i will ask you to give some tips to people who want to although you have already you know shared quite a lot of tips and ideas that people can already work on but before ending this session i would like you to address that question once again and uh, before that i would like to have that the, the you know you know the, the most fun part of this session which i like to call word association slash rabbit fire <laughs> where say something oh, yeah. and it's ahead just say it out loud that's all you have to do don't think much just say <laughs> whatever comes right okay. so okay. let's do this all right so uh, the first prompt for you is describe yourself as a teenager in just three words as a teenager in three words um, as a teenager. careless um uh-huh. funny I, i think most of my friends okay. think that i'm funny or at least i want to believe that most of my friends think i'm funny and i'm happy feeling that way um, all right it's sporty sporty i i used to be in a lot of sports at at some stage in my life <laughs> Okay, <laughs> good to hear that. <laughs> All right. So next prompt for you is um so you have a weekend and what would you pick? A party which goes on for like the entire weekend or would you go for a hike? So, uh if you would have asked me this question when I came to United States, I mean the obvious uh-huh. choice was party and that's what okay. I did. there was nothing else on my mind when i came here i had this new found free freedom okay. that i didn't know what to do with and my whole okay. idea of a weekend which started for me it started on a thursday would be to go and party in clubs or house parties all the way till saturday night and then sunday is when you try to recover from it but now if you ask me um it's mostly hiking um if i have a choice between a party or hiking and now i prefer hiking over because i've i've gone through that phase i've lived that life i've enjoyed that life no regrets i think uh, i i enjoyed it to the fullest but now i'm in that stage where i prefer hiking over parties at least okay. not all right not clubbing parties i would rather have a party where it's me sitting with a bunch of friends and yeah. drinking and eating if if it's a party it's, it's going to be that but i prefer okay. hiking now yes okay perfect all right so um all right the next thing for you is that you know what is that one thing in your handbag that's always there that one thing that you cannot take out it has to be there <laughs> this is going to be a very silly answer it's it's my allergy medication <laughs> wow I, I okay it's telling my uh, friends that you know living in the united states uh, you start getting all these problems that you never had in india um uh-huh. I, i've lived in delhi and uh, you know there is dirt there is dust and i was never allergic to these things and i come to united states and i'm allergic to the clean air that is there i, <laughs> I sneeze so much that i cannot go anywhere without my allergy medications oh, wow all right okay so if you could have somebody for dinner who would it be like one person anybody somebody for dinner yes uh it's been so long that i've sat with my sister and had dinner that that's the first person that comes to my mind is if i get a chance if i can just go back sit with my sister you know, she's learned cooking in the past few years so i really want to test it out that what is this that everybody keeps praising her for uh it would be a dinner with my sister it doesn't even have to be in india any part of the world if i can get a chance uh if i can just sit with her and have a one on one conversation um that, all right. that's all on my mind right now that was it for our uh, rapid fire slash word association session thanks for being so honest and thanks for you know sharing all those answers with us now before i let you go i just want one last uh topic with you so basically any tips that you would like to give to the future generations to people who are planning to get into the same direction as you and yeah so anything that you know you would like to share that would make it just a bit easier for them so um like i mentioned before i would say that if um if grad school research is something that you want to 
uh, pursue this as a career, I would say that especially for grad school, I, it's a very, very long commitment. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to say that try to get yourself into some of the uh, institutions in India that offer this kind of uh, opportunities for research practices. Um, like um, there is CSIR in India, uh, Serum Institute of India. All these are investing heavily into research. In fact, you know, um, the, these universities are actually coming up with co-vaccine, which is uh, the vaccine that India is pre- uh, working on right now for COVID-19. So there's a lot of research going on in some of these prestigious universities. And I think it's a good thing to volunteer out there and get some hands-on experience on how research works and feel it yourself if you like this or not. Uh, at the same time, I wouldn't say give up on it in a day or two. Nobody enjoys research in a day because this is a field, like I said before, there are more failures than successes. Mm-hmm. And uh, you have to wait for that success to come and you have to wait for it very patiently. Uh, but the the feeling that you're going to get once that you hit that success is going to be great. So I would say mm-hmm. that at least when you volunteer, volunteer for six to six months to a year and get a good understanding of is this something that you enjoy? Do you enjoy that feeling when you have that one success after a full year of working crazy hours and, you know, failing over and over? Can you maintain your uh, patience to Mm -hmm. reach that point? Um, Can you work with people? Because um, there is no concept of uh, a lone survivor in the field of science. You can never be that person. You always have to work with people help the other people and get help from others to actually survive and flourish in this field. So I would say that if you can go to these institutions in India and get some hands-on experience, you'll get a good picture of uh, what your next six years are going to be like. And if you enjoy this, then there is no end to the kind of opportunities that you can get. And I'm not just talking about United States. Um, Mm -hmm. We have to understand that science, um, it's it's uh, the same thing like when you say doctors without borders, when you are thinking about science, science is not uh, about, okay, my country came up with say, this thing and that country came up with this thing. Everybody is always right. working collaboratively. Even in my company right now, we are actually working with the, um, some uh, institutes of India. Even in my postdoc, uh, there were uh, labs in India that we were constantly collaborating with. So, um you'll get a good idea working in your institutes, which are in India, that what kind of research um, is going on. And that can help you understand whether this is something that you can do for the next many, many years, or at least the six years of grad school, if you want to do in the United States. And uh, then you can make a a good decision about this. Um, And if you think that this is something that excites you, then there are so many opportunities in many countries that you can go to any place any work that excites you i think it's always that in your country you can always come back it's your home you can always bring back what you learned in a different country home again because like i said science has no borders you can go to another country get yourself trained and you can come back and teach it in your own country if you like or you can keep moving across the globe and you move your science with you wherever you go. And yeah. ultimately it benefits everybody. Um, so Absolutely. I would say that try to go and get your hands wet into these um, experimental labs. And I think that will really help you to right. make an honest decision about whether this is what you want to pursue or not. Right. Absolutely. Wow, Lipakshi, I have to thank you once again for, you know, sparing out that much time for this conversation and sharing all that you just shared with us. And I can't wait for our uh, audio session wherein we will get into the depth of your work a bit more. And uh, this has been absolutely amazing. And have a beautiful, beautiful weekend. Have a beautiful Saturday. I hope you you can, you know, just go and get a little nap and that will be on me. (laughs) (laughs) no thank you so much for inviting me over for this um i'm glad that i could share some of my failures and hopefully this can help somebody succeed faster than uh, whatever i achieved um and yeah i'm happy to answer anybody's questions if they want to um 
you already know my Instagram page. I'll oh, keep yeah. <laughs> working on this and following that. And if people have any questions, I'm more than happy to help. Um, some a lot of people helped me when I came to this country, and all they always told me was that don't give us anything back. But when somebody else needs that kind of help, be there and keep passing that that on. And I think anybody can flourish in any part of the world if you can all keep helping each other in that sense. Right. So yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I think that's a very you know a uh, beautiful note to sort of end this conversation on so thank you once again labakshi and have a beautiful day night to you oh, oh yes <laughs> all right bye 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 all right guys that was a very very long discussion with dr labakshi khurana about her life around science and uh, so this episode and all the other episodes will be posted on youtube on my um podcast on spotify itunes alexa uh soundcloud wherever basically just type in shruti podcast shruti outloud <laughs> i am like you know so lost right now shruti outloud podcast and you'll find me so thank you for sticking by thank you for uh, being a part of this session and i'm so glad that we could have dr lipakshi khurana for this discussion and i am looking forward to a lot of more episodes with a lot many more guests and keep bringing in their journey the awareness and all of those aspects towards a better life thank you